Hello, welcome to this presentation, Black Feminist Musings on Algorithmic Oppression by Lila Marie Hampton. I'll start with a theory of oppression. Um, so with oppression, groups are disempowered so that other groups can be empowered. And um, oppressive institutional systems and forces shape and combine oppressed people's lives in a way that is intentional, chronic, and inescapable. And these systems operate inseparably as to penalize motion in any direction. Now, what is to be gained from oppression? Well, socioeconomic and political material benefits. And when we look at oppression from a Black feminist lens, we can understand that those who benefit from oppression are young, thin, able, Christian, affluent, cis heterosexual, white men, etc. Thus, these systems of oppression are what Bell Hooks refers to as the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, cis heteropatriarchy. Parentheses are my own. And according to Black feminism, all oppression must be abolished. We cannot abolish one and not abolish the other or abolish three and not abolish four. Um, all oppression must be abolished or oppression will never cease. And this idea is especially important for those who face oppression at multiple fronts. So algorithmic oppression solidifies the idea that institutions, structures, and systems of oppression are fundamental to the perpetuation of oppressive technology. And to that end, the concept of algorithmic bias actually obscures the very real social structures that are contributing to the outcomes of algorithms. And they create a picture that in a neoliberal way, these outcomes are unintentional or not in bad faith, rather than an intentional byproduct of oppressive institutions from which um, oppressors can gain material benefits. And so will more diversity in tech solve algorithmic oppression? Hell no. And so many times diversity is proposed as a solution. Um, people will say, well, if there were more of this group of people in there, this wouldn't have happened. And that's not necessarily the case. And diversity as a solution actually shifts responsibilities from technology companies um, for creating purposely harmful technologies to um, tokens within the company who are often Black and Indigenous um, and telling them that they have to fix it, all the while not materially changing their conditions, all the while not addressing the violent outcomes of their technologies, or even acknowledging responsibility for harming communities, um, and not even trying to um, mitigate harm for them by, say, if there was a healthcare algorithm that was um, having a harmful outcome, paying their hospital bills or something to that effect, this never happens, right? So yeah, so diversity is not necessarily the solution to solving issues in technology. And so I want to just discuss some non-exhaustive examples of algorithmic oppression to demonstrate that while oppressors call these issues fairness, our lives are actually at stake, whether it's a life or death situation or a material outcome that can um, deepen our oppression or um, you know, yeah, deepen our, our oppression. But yeah, so for instance, Black people have been tagged as gorillas and apes in the Google search engine. Mind you, this epithet has actually been used to justify chattel slavery, as well as slavery on the African continent during colonial times. And even today, um, and I'll get into that a little later. And the police state has weaponized predictive policing against Black and Brown people, um, this is especially concerning for Black people um, because in the U.S. at least, um, policing actually has a genesis in slave patrols. There's a very long history there. And autonomous AI weapons are being used to murder people and children in the global South. A lot of times these people and children are Black and Brown. And... Facial recognition and TSA technology is misgendering, surveilling, targeting, and outing trans folks. And this um, kind of demonstrates the issue of classification that is so inherent in white male epistemology because queerness and transness actually resists labels, resists these very 
firm labels and classifications by being very fluid. Um, also filtering that shows higher paying job ads to men more often than women is going to especially harm um, Black and Latinx women who actually have a larger pay gap. Also, when you add the extra burden of being a single mother in a single income household, this can harm women even more, right? And have very material be outcomes on um, women's lives. And so poor folks are also um, denied healthcare, bank loans, and other resources, which honestly, they're often denied anyway, even outside of technology. And so technology is actually just you know, in ways taking the place of the human making that decision and making the same decision. And um, there's a continued incorporation of pr predictive analytics by um, U.S. social welfare, welfare agencies, and they're being weaponized against poor people. Healthcare companies are weaponizing non-consensually collected health data to deny coverage to disabled people and often cutting their benefits without even telling them why they're cutting their benefits. And often their social worker can't even tell them because they don't know how the algorithm works. And there are healthcare algorithms selecting white people to receive healthcare interventions more than black people, um, which is very harmful because of a long history of medical racism. And we also have black and brown Muslims being stalked and surveilled and systematically targeted um, using a lot of carceral technologies. And we also have black Latinx and Asian female minors being sexually fetishized in a search engine all of which have very, very um, harmful histories and harmful impacts on, very violent impacts also on oppressed people's lives. And so when we view this through a Black feminist lens, we can see that we can't call these anything less than violent because if we do that, then we miscomprehend the severity with which algorithms um, impact the lives of oppressed people. And so to that end, if we want to live in a better world inside and outside of technology, we have to not only abolish algorithmic oppression, but all oppression as well. And so also relating to kind of a feminist lens is the idea of the double bind of technology. So we're going to um, show two examples of invisibility versus hypervisibility. And so for invisibility, um, I propose the example of um, a healthcare algorithm not choosing Black people for extra um, care interventions. And what this actually does is perpetuate medical racism, especially because the study by Dressel and Farid showed that at the highest risk for Black people actually had more chronic illnesses than white people. And this is really, really harmful. And so hypervisibility, I show the example of predictive policing, targeting Black neighborhoods. And what this does is it actually perpetuates the violence of the police state against Black people. And so what this shows, this double bind shows, is that we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. No matter what we do, again, oppression is very um, inescapable, it's intentional, and it's chronic. So none of this is by mistake. All of these things happen because of socio-historical continuums of oppression. And so I kind of want to um, discuss fairness a little bit and these um, notions of fairness. And so um, fairness is actually kind of, in a way, trying to address this idea of limited resources with respect to capitalism. But oftentimes it um, neglects to understand that this is actually very intentional. Racial capitalism is set up such that there's a hierarchy of resources and marginalized people are not supposed to have these resources, right? Um, and also, um, I think on fairness, I think from a marginalized perspective, and why it's important to include marginalized people's perspective, is because I don't want any algorithm that's unfair to me as a Black person, as a queer person, um, as a trans person, etc., to harm um, anybody else. Like, I don't want an algorithm that's targeting um, me as a Black person to equally target white people, um, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I don't want, I, for instance, I don't want the police state to target anybody or hand any of us over to the prison industrial complex to be abused as slave labor. That's not what I want. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. And so on transparency, there's obviously a lot of bene benefits to transparency, um, a lot, a lot. And so 
but there's also limitations. And so one of the limitations is that, um, for instance, say that we make autonomous AI weapons transparent. Does that mean that now we know what the code says or we know what it's doing on the inside of the algorithm that it's going to stop killing people? Not necessarily. And I know some might argue, well, transparency is actually important for, say, criminal criminal defense cases um, to be able to argue against the algorithms in court in question. However, this kind of goes to support the idea that, oh, well, punitive systems will act rationally when shown counter evidence. And this is simply not true because actually when you look at um, the lack of transparency of algorithms, you also have to understand that judges actually invoked um, or judges allowed companies to invoke trade secrets on algorithms. And so partially it's the judges um, who have um, allowed this. And so this is not necessarily the case. And also um, one of the points of um, technologies, oppressive technologies, honestly, there is many times where the intention is to target a specific group. And I would say carceral technologies are that specific group. So transparency, transparency is not a um, catch-all as a fix to um, issues, I suppose. And so also there's um, this question of how do you hold oppressive technologies accountable in an oppressive world? Because often violence is dealt with impunity. Um, and yeah. And so kind of this conversation poses the question, should we divest from fairness? And I will arbitrarily answer that because I don't know that I have an arbitrary answer for that anyway. But um, what I do know is that many times non-Black researchers actually go out of their way to legitimize systems that Black and brown people are working tirelessly to abolish. Coming up on a year now, uh, Black Lives Matter movement has... Um, Almost has um, actually popularized, I'll say that I'm comfortable saying that, popularized um, the abolition movement. And we have worked tirelessly for that, um, you know, within the past year. And obviously, there's many, many years before that where that happened also. But that is one of the um, ongoing consensuses right now. And still in the year of our Lord 2021, we have um, researchers trying to make recidivism algorithms more fair. And that's very concerning because it kind of um, makes me feel like they're not listening to Black people. And that's a form of epistemic injustice. And to that end, I also don't know that fairness has an answer to certain questions. Like, for instance, how do you make an autonomous AI weapon fair? Um, and also, I don't know that fairness has um, an answer to these dystopian situations either. And also, I feel like fairness literature does also does a lot to ensure more fair distribution of outcomes and resources, right? But it doesn't always critique racial capitalism, which is one of the reasons why they have to even go about making these more fair distributions of something, right? So that discussion is always, or is usually um, left out. And so again, back to the idea that we have to abolish um, all oppression to abolish algorithmic oppression. I want to share a lovely quote. Calls for abolition are never simply about bringing harmful systems to an end, but also about envisioning new ones. Even so, there's some challenges to abolition. So one of the challenges to abolition is that um, it's not necessarily as easy as creating emancipatory technologies. And so, and also oppressive epistemology informs the architecture and design of computing. And to that end, even if we are using, like, say, machine learning or classification algorithm to do something nice for our communities, it's still rooted in this um, Western white male ep epistemological notion of classifying things very rigidly, right? And so that in and of itself is problematic. And we actually do need to prob problematize that. And so another challenge to abolition is imperialism and racial capitalism because they directly inform the creation of computing at large and machine learning specifically. I just gave an example, but um, even down to um, our digital technology, 
our technologies cannot even be made if we do not extract minerals from Africa using slave labor. So our um, so the creation of technologies is very much rooted in imperialism and racial capitalism. It's so inextricable. Even down to, again, the minerals in our bone. Because even Congolese children have died as a result of this, of trying to get minerals for our phone. And there's a current um, ongoing lawsuit um, with Congolese parents whose children have died and Microsoft, Tesla, and Dell. Well, I think they actually won that lawsuit. But uh, yeah, and there were some more companies also. And so even though um, it may not be as easy um, to you know, create, you know, it, abolition may not be as easy as creating emancipatory technologies. We can still dream, right? And so I actually wanted to leave um, the audience with something nice and something uplifting. And so um, I'll just go into a couple of examples. One of the examples is Team Code Guru, who created the Her Health BB Kit, which determines the likelihood of having bacterial vaginosis and then directs high likelihood users to the nearest medical resources. Um, Team Go Guru is founded by Ugandan University students, Margaret, Jacqueline, Esther, Pauline, and Bridget. Um, there's also Abolition, or excuse me, Abolition, which is a portmanteau of abolition and application, and it converts daily change into bail money to free Black people. It's founded by Dr. Courtney Zeigler and Tiffany McHale. And what's also interesting about abolition is it also, like, it relates to a couple of ideas, including police abolition, prison abolition, and cash bail abolition. And I absolutely love that. And so there's also data for Black Lives, which is working a lot to abolish big data and has also done some really um, profound things in terms of using data science to show disparities, COVID disparities. And the founders are Yeshi Milner and Lucas Mason Brown. And I would like to say that these examples are a part of an ongoing history of people across the African diaspora using technology, including computing, st statistics, data science, machine learning, et cetera, um, to create emancipatory technologies and or use technology to resist um, oppressive systems. And sometimes both at the same time, right? And I would also say that this is part of, so some, some of the technologies that are part of this history are um, Ida B. Wells, The Red Record, and also W.E.B. Du Bois's um, and his team of statisticians. And so also, lastly, there's a space called the Blackathon, for the African diaspora to imagine liberatory technologies. And if you actually want to see more examples of emancipatory technologies created by Black people dating back to the 20th century, you can feel free to go to the website. The event will be hosted February 26th to February 28th of this year. Lastly, I just want to thank you for, for um, being a part of the audience. And if you want to um, chat, feel free to email me and my slides will be available at my website. Thank you.